everybody and welcome back to Plone Conference 2021, day three. Uh, I'm here with David Ekim and he is a web developer at Udu Web and he is going to be talking to us uh, about some Volto enhancements that are currently there and some that we'll see in the future. Okay, so I can take it then. Hello. As yes, take it away. My host mentioned my name is David Ikim. I'm a oh. Okay, as I was saying, my name is David Ikim. I'm a Plone developer, and for about a year already, also a Volto developer working with Odo Web Romania. The title of my talk today is "What's New in Volto for Developers." A little bit more about me. I've been working on Plone websites since version two, and I continue to work on Plone websites even today. For the past 10 years, I've worked mainly on the European Environmental Agency website. However, in the last few years, I have also worked on several environmental thematic websites, such as Biodiversity or Freshwater, which are now Volto powered websites. I'm going to start this talk highlighting the main Volto releases that were done in the past year. Volto has been growing at a staggering pace with the many contributions made by Kit Concept, or the Web, Red Turtle, Rothberg, and so many more. Because of Victor Fernandez de Alba, who is the release manager and the tireless Volto maintainer, we had a lot of Volto releases which you can clearly see by following with me the next release numbers. We had four major releases in a single year, which is a staggering amount of releases when we compare the releases of other products, including Pro. These four major releases were intertwined by 40 minor releases, then 36 alpha releases, 25 patch releases for a total of 105 releases, which is a big firework moment, as my slide background clearly shows. Plus, besides the Volta releases, we also had some new tooling and tools releases. For instance, we have the new internationalization package, which has four major releases, and we also have the Volto generator, which now also has four major releases. I'm gonna start now to present the new features that were added or enhanced, starting with Volto 10 and upwards to almost Volto 14 now. The first one is the new Volto config. You, it is dubbed as Volto configuration registry. In essence, it is a centralized singleton that is populated from the core config module. It was added in Volto 12 as optional, but it was made mandatory in Volto 14. It was introduced to fix circular import dependency problems, which we previously had with the old system. As a good side effects of this new Volto configuration, hot loading, is working again. If you want to read the entire documentation, you can check out the link added in the slide. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of code examples. The first one, we can see the old way of importing the configuration. Previously, we had to import settings from tilde config if you wanted to set is multilingual to true. Now, the new way to set is multilingual to true requires that we import config from Plone Volto registry, and then we prefix settings that is multilingual with config. Next up, we have new internationalization infrastructure and the changes that were brought by this new infrastructure. First of all, the internationalization infrastructure is now a separate package from Plone from Volto, which means that it can have independent releases from Volto, just like the other packages that are bundled with Volto, such as the Volto project generator. 
This new infrastructure also allows the same package to be used for the generation of internationalization of add-ons. The good news is that the upgrade is easy and well-documented in the upgrade guide. You can reference this upgrade guide at the far following URL. I have to give you a little bit of code examples. Here are some of the changes that you need to do in your packages in order to take advantage of this new internationalization packages. In your projects package.json, within the script tag section, for the i18n key, set the following value. Then in your add-ons package.json, you make the same modification as in the projects package.json with the addition of minus minus add-on. In the same file, we also need to add a dependency on clone scripts. This is needed almost only for the add-on package as Volto projects depend on Volto and Volta has this dependency set already, just like we do within the add-ons. Next up, I'll be discussing a little bit about forms as schema. Forms as schema means that forms should be constructed from schemas instead of by hand. This means that the inline form is the component that allows us to create the forms for blocks from a schema instead of doing them by hand. If blocks use a schema, then they can have variations on how that schema should be presented. This brings the powerful concept of block variations, which we'll discover in the future. Closely related to the block variations, since schema is guaranteed, it means that we can also extend it with the help of schema extenders, which allows us to introduce extra features to a block while keeping the original clean and lean as Volto's philosophy demands it. You can check out more info about this feature at the following URL. Now, let's discuss a little bit the problems that are solved by having forms of schemas. We have several problems that are solved and some of them are the fact that we no longer need to manually create and copy fields, which is mundane and tedious and not following the don't repeat yourself principle. We also have reusability, which allows us to focus on expressing interactions as widgets. This means that we as developers also spend considerably less time making these forms. Having the schema enhancing abilities means that they are open the door to having forms that are extensible from other add-ons. Next up, let's discuss new widgets. And since Volto is a React powered front end, for Plone, which is a CMS, it relies on content editing, which is done by editors. We need to provide them with fields that are enhanced by widgets. As such, they will have a few new toys to play with. First up, I'm going to discuss the object list widget. You can think of it as an equivalent to data grid field from Plone Classic. It is used in Volta Core by the search block. For instance, the facets objects are constructed by this widget. This widget is very useful for the creation of repeatable objects. These objects, you can drag and drop them as you wish and even show and hide the widget content due to the accordion implementation. Let's check out now a code example. We don't need to show the entire code. Instead, we can just focus on the widget registration. For the facet reference in the image from the previous slide, this is how they were registered, using a schema for the generation of the widget fields. And we even have a schema standard defined in case we want to enhance that schema from other add-ons. Next, I'm going to be talking about the object browser widget. It was added in Volta 4 originally as part of a block. But now you can also use it as a widget. 
as a widget, it now allows the addition of external content when its configuration is set to allow externals. The widget also has several modes, such as link, image, or multiple, with plans to enhance it with support for other mods in the future. When mode is set to link, pasting an internal link will be converted to a tokenized value. Let's check out a code example. Notice in this code example, the mode and allow externals attributes that I mentioned in the previous slide. In this case, the href field will use the object pro browser in link mode, and it will allow for external URLs to be added. Here we have a small image where we can check out the tokenization when we use internal links. In this case, the previously entered URL link was an internal URL. As such, it now looks like a select widget entry. Next up, we have another image. And for situations where we enter an external link, the value will still be tokenized and it will still look like a select widget entry with the only difference that now the value is longer. Next, let's talk about query string widget. This is another widget that we have in Stock Volto. And this is the query string widget. It's modeled and it behaves like its counterpart from Plone App Query String. It allows us to create search criteria. For instance, it is used in the search block by the facet objects, which themselves are used to then filter the search results. Then let's talk about the URL widget. We can't have a web framework without an URL widget. So naturally needs, Volto needs to have an URL widget as well. It can be used on text inputs and using it on these inputs means that it knows to validate their value as an URL. You can use it on both internal and external links. And as seen in the image, it provides validation errors when the value of the input is in a valid URL. Registering the widget to be used on your schema field is easy, having to set only the widget name to URL. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the vocabulary terms widget. It was made by Katia Seuss. This widget acts as a source for a simple vocabulary or a choice field. I don't have a lot of details about it due to lack of time on my part for playing with it, but please check out the pull request that I've linked in the bullet points for this slide. Her workflow for developing a pull request is very interesting. For instance, when you visit the pull request, you can see that any changes are accompanied by a small screen cast to the storybook for this widget which you can interact with right away by going to the storyboot section of the Volto docs. I've added a small link and when I'll be pasting the slides somewhere, you can click on it and play around with the switch. Then let's talk about new blocks. Since last year, we only had a few blocks added to Volto core. The first block added is the search block contributed by Tiberi and Christina from all the web. The second block, the teaser block is technically not yet in core. However, there is ongoing work as we speak to integrate the teaser block from kit concept Volto grid blocks within core. I was going to do a live demo regarding the search block. However, since my talk is a day later than the state of Volto talk, it would be redundant for me to showcase it again, as I assume that everybody has already watched Timo's talk. Still, I'm gonna briefly show in the following images, the fact that the block is easy to find, easy to add, and easy to configure. Starting with easy to add, just go to a block enabled Volto page, hit the add block icon, go to common section, and choose the search block, which is the one with the eyeglass icon. Next, we have a screenshot showcasing the facet configuration. Using the object list widget, 
it provides a straightforward way to configure the search filtering options. These assets, we can either display them to the end user or we can pre-program them to achieve the desired outcome while at the same time hiding them from the search block view. This is achieved by toggling the hide facet checkbox, which you can find at the bottom of this image. Finally, here is this last screenshot where we can see the search block view in action alongside the filters and the result listing, which can be configured from the block edit options. Next up, let's discuss about pluggables. Introduce in Volta Core by Tiberiu. The pluggables framework gives you insertion points to push components to other components. They are similar to React's portal component, which we already use in Volta Core and in several Volta add-ons. However, while this framework is similar to the portal components, you will quickly find out that it's more powerful and more extensible than the React counterpart. We have some written documentation about pluggables found at the documentation site for the Volta project. I prepared the short URL so that it's easier to access. Better yet, in case you want to get into the technical details and see some real world examples, I suggest you check out Volta Pub pluggable stock held by Tiberio Ekin. Next, we have Storybook. Storybook provides a sandbox to build and test visual components in isolation. It is used by many projects and companies working with React components to showcase the interactions and the capabilities of the components that are used in their projects. We have some disadvantages in our current Storybook setup and workflow where right now it is only used by Volta Core. There is no generator template that scaffolds any storybook skeleton that can be used by the Volta projects or add-ons where you might be working with on. As such, there is a need for help with work to have storybooks set up with add-ons. You can check out the current list of components and widgets that are already showcased at the storybook deployment from Volto documentation site. I've linked to it in my slide. And if you would like to learn more about storybooks, I suggest you see storybook talk held by Victor for more details. Here is a simple image where I just showcase the first thing that shows up whenever you visit the link in my previous slide. Next, let's talk about critical CSS. Introduced by work done for EA websites, where we strive to deliver high performance and functional websites, we knew from the start that we would need a system to inline the critical CSS of the website. We do so already within the EA main website that is still running Plone 4.3 for quite a while. So now that we transition to Volta powered websites, Knowing that inline critical CSS delivers a big rendering boost to the initial page rendering, we had to have a similar feature for the Volto sites like we do on the older Plone sites. Out of this desire, critical CLI was born, which is a command line utility to help you output the critical CSS from your site. We will see how easy it is to use this tool in the next slides. For now, however, I will also mention that this critical CSS file is inlined in header while regular CSS is moved to the bottom of the body in the rendered site HTML output. As usual, I added a small link where you can get more information about this feature. You can run the critical CLI tool by, run it, by using the command above and you can check out the parameters that this tool can receive by running with, with critical CLI minus H. Next, let's talk about lazy loading utils. Since last year, the lazy loading of React libraries has been improved. We now have in Volto a new higher order component wrapper named inject lazy libs in order to help you inject lazy loaded libraries as props to your components. If we look at the code snippet below the slide points, 
we can see how easy it is to inject the Toastify library to the My Component component. In this example, Toastify is a library that is already loaded in the main bundle since there are several components that make use of it. But you can imagine that in other cases, you might have a React library that you want to use only in a certain page where you have a specific component loaded. Since the component is special, you do not have to load this extra dependency within your main bundle. And instead, it makes more sense to lazy load only where you need it. The extra benefit that this higher component provides is that the component will only render once all of the lazy loaded libraries finish loading. Next, let's talk about Express.js middleware. Volto uses the Express.js web framework for server side rendering and static resource serving. This is a great thing since the framework is popular in the Node.js world, and we don't have to suffer from the not invented here syndrome. You can find plenty of online tutorials, both in written and in video format about this for framework. Since we use Express.js for the server-side rendering of the Volto resources, it also means that we can write custom middleware for Volto. This middleware concept is the solution coming from Express.js to allow developers to write custom requests and response pages. For example, in this code slide, we can see a custom route named test middleware, where our code instructs to express to simply serve a hello world response instead of having served a different response from the usual Volta routes. The middleware needs to have an ID in order to avoid any conflicts with other potentially loaded vendor middlewares. The only code that is needed in order to register this middleware within the Volto is to add it to the express middleware object from config.settings.express middleware. Here in this site, we actually see something quite cool. A middleware implemented by Razvan Mule from all the web, where you can register an array of paths that will go through virtual host master from Zop instead of having those paths loaded by Volto. This is very useful when you have browser views in your Plone backend, which render content that can also be used from Volto as it is, without any need of resource rendering from Volto. One example might be the IRSS feed browser view, which would not work otherwise when called from the Volto front end without this package. Next, let's discuss API expanders. Starting from the backend, with the support of expanders from Plon.REST API, API expanders allow the expansion of different API endpoints from Volto with calls from your custom endpoints. This is useful when you have, when you want to have the endpoint resolve rendered when retrieving the initial page content. Thus, we avoid an extra XHR call after retrieving the initial document content. This would be useful only for content that is critical to have on this document content render. As a personal suggestion, avoid adding too many expanders if they are not critical to the initial page rendering, as that means that the initial page rendering will take longer to compute and render. In a Volto site, for instance, since the workflow state is rendered within the left side toolbar and is visible only when you are logged in, it makes no sense to have that info loaded when the page loads. And that information can be loaded on demand when the user needs it, such as the moment when they click on the workflow menu. Here is a simple code example. In our case, we register for it there for the get content action, a custom endpoint named rest.endpoint. And if we do so, then our Volto site will be called with question mark expanding our rest endpoint. And that means that 
our content will also render the response from this endpoint. Next, let's discuss async props extenders. This feature was added in Vault to enable server-side rendering of content that depends on additional props coming from backend calls. Besides the addition of props, this feature is versatile enough that it also can be used to exclude certain API calls from being requested. For instance, in this code sample from the root path, we exclude the breadcrumb action from dispatching. This means that for this route, we will not request, request any breadcrumb endpoint, and as such, the root page loads without a breadcrumb. In another example, taken from a Volto add-on made by Red Turtle named Volto Editable Footer, we can see that for the root route, if we don't find it already in the sync actions, the action with the key editable footer, this action is pushed to the dispatch action list, which stores the result of this action within the Redux store. This means that the final page render will contain the markup from this component that was created to render the action result. Next, let's talk about external routes. This is actually a very useful feature where you have an application that is published under the same top domain. At EEA, we have such a situation where we have the default website served by Plone 4.3. And from a single fo folder onwards, we, solve, we serve a Volto application. When you are on a page that is Volto powered, where you have links which point to the Plone backend, Volto is aggressive and it will try to render those paths as if they are coming from Volto. When that happens, that URL can go from mildly annoying to full blown panic mode. For this exact reason, we have config.settings.external routes setting, which allows you to pass a list of React router match paths where we instruct Volto not to attempt to render anything. In this real world example, which is slightly more complex than the one found in the previous slide, we can see that this list of external routes can also accept paths that are constructed using regular expressions. In our case, we wanted to treat any route that doesn't match the IMS path, plus the other three that are default, default routes from Volto, which you see in this rejects as external routes. Thus, when we attempt to view something outside of the IMS folder, then the old plum backend will start rendering those links. Next, we have seamless mode. Introduced in Volto 13, it was enhanced in Volto 14, which isn't released yet, but it's with a lot of alphas so I'm going to be talking about it. In the implementation done in Volta 13, it tried to unify both front-end and back-end servers under the same path. Unfortunately, that brought a host of problems, some of which are mentioned in the pull request that I'm linking to. A really big problem was that the browser back button, when triggered, showed the JSON response under some circumstances. Seamless mode, Main goals is to achieve zero build configuration and avoiding hard-coded API path or other environmental variables involved. I will be mentioning now some of the reasoning given by Victor for the changes that were made in Volto 14. These were the problems that we wanted to solve. We wanted to avoid having to expose and publish the classic UI if you don't really need it. If possible, we want to avoid having to rewrite all API responses since it returns paths that do not correspond to the original object handled and seen from Volto. 
Because of this, you have to adjust them via a cold helper in a lot of call responses. This also allows us to simplify Docker builds, making all of the configuration via the runtime environment variables. Let's see some code examples. Before for Volto 14, you would run Volto like this. Razzle API path equals something, yarn build, and then we would start. From Volto 14 and onwards, you can now move the environment variables defined to the start stage. This brings you a lot of power since you don't have to build on every config change. And now you can also generate builds on your continuous integration infrastructure and then deploy them anywhere as needed. Next, let's talk about context navigation component. Volta provides now a, Volt, a navigation portlet component. Similar to Plone navigation portlet, as the Plone REST API implementation is based on that original code. Its props, as mentioned, are similar to classic Plone navigation portlet. It is up to the user to implement it in whatever view is necessary. For the moment, it's not added anywhere, but the view is there and you can enable it by just simply loading it in whatever you view you desire. You can check out the documentation at the following URL. Next, let's talk about some work in progress that are going on right now in Volto, but they are not done yet. First off, let's talk about slots. Slots are Volto's answer to portlets. I don't want to get into too many details. As you can see, the Volto slots talk, which is held by Tiberi Yukim, if you want to learn about more details. If I'm not mistaken, it's going to be on the same track where I'm at right now, and you can check out that talk later. Then we also have an image proxy. This allows us to provide image scale generation that is done by a middleware made with JavaScript instead of using plon.scales. You can check out the progress of this feature at the following URL where you can see the pull request alongside the work in progress. Then I might be wrong about this slide. If I do so, I apologize. I've written down that we want to reference the authentication from backend. This was already started by Victor and will perhaps be done by Volto 14. And this work was done in part by the new seamless mode, which was made again by Victor. Then another work in progress that we have right now is to replace replace DraftJS with Volto Slate. What is missing right now is a migration tool from DraftJS to Volto Slate. However, we have a little bit of announcement, which unfortunately was again given by Tiberio a couple of days ago. But since I'm not an early talker, I guess I can also announce again that work has started on a block converse, conversion tool. You can check out this tool at the following URL. Then there is also a desire to have a sync blocks that also work with server-side rendering. This feature again is a work in progress and you can check out the current state at the following pull request. Another desire which has already started is to have defaults in the block forms. You can check out again the current state at the following pull request. Besides the work in progress, there is also some fu future work to do. These is, are actually some of the desires that my brother has, and I think there were in part also talked about with Victor. I'm gonna enumerate them now. 
one thing that would be nice is to have defaults in all widgets. I know for a fact that defaults have already started to be configured in some widgets, more to follow. Then we can talk about enabling block enhancers in all blocks. It's actually quite uh, nice. And um, in part, the easiest thing that we can do is to enable the block variations. So you can check and select different view templates and then we can also move to the schema enhancers. Then a really good thing that we would like to have is storybooks that are also added in add-ons. Right now, as I mentioned in my previous slides, the configuration is only done for the Vault domain project, but I hope we can all contribute storybook also in add-ons. Then we have a pull request or an issue to upgrade to the newest React Intel package. It's always good to have newer versions in order not to linger with old versions, which can also bring security issues. Then we have a folder contents component refactoring. Right now, there is a lot of hard coding done and with the latest patterns that we have learned in the last year, it would be very useful to refactor this component. Then something else would be to have form editing test text enhancements, where it would be easier for you to modify your text inputs. One desire that Tiberia has is for a group, group block, which if included in Volto, will allow it to re be reused in accordion block, column blocks, tab blocks, or other blocks that house other blocks of content. And then of course, everybody wants the new Quanta toolbar, which I'm pretty sure that we'll find out more about whenever Victor gives his talk. I would like to now take some moments to thank the Volto early community adopters. I've uh, written down the names of each individual from the following companies that have added a commit in the last year to Volto. I'm not gonna mention everybody, but I will give it a few moments for you to see their names. Plus I might be butchering their names and this is not what I intend to do. I simply want to thank them for the work that they have done. Now that we have seen the people from all the web and kit concept, let's move to the next slide where we see the contributions made by the people from Red Turtle and Rothberg. Again, I have a lot of things to talk about due to the contributions made by these people. I've made nothing. I simply bragged about what this community has done. So thank you. Besides the organizations which added these commits, uh, we also have a bunch of uh, commits from individual contributors and I've uh, written them here. And uh, ConSyntax is also an organization, but I've uh, added them here since it balances my uh, left and right listing of people who have contributed. You can check out the entire list of contributors for Volto at the following URL. I specifically only added the people who made contributions in the last year, since the last PlongConf, since my talk is about the, la the newest features that were added in Volto since the last Plong conference. If you want to check out the entire list of contributors of Volto, please check out the GitHub repo where GitHub provides the graph with all of the contributors 
that have contributed to Volto since the beginning of time. With that, my slides are concluded and I would like to thank you for listening to me. I hope that you have enjoyed some of the robotic mentions that I have given to you with some of the changes that were added in Volto in last year. It's not easy for me to mention all of this as the, my last talk was given six years ago. And as you can clearly see, I am severely lacking some presentation skills and that's it. Thank you. And um, if you have any questions, I guess we can join meet where I will not be giving any technical information, but I hope to have Tiberio and Victor present. And if the mentions are too technical, I'm sure they will be more than glad to help, help me answering whatever questions you might have to ask the Volto community and the core contributors to Volto. With uh, this, I'm going to stop talking and I will uh, give back the mic to our host. Thank you. Thank you, David, for providing so much detail on Volto and the enhancements and the future roadmap. Um, if anyone would like to continue this conversation, I've posted the face-to-face -face Jitsi link in the track one channel on our Slack. And uh, thanks again for providing such an excellent presentation.